Good morning, everyone. It's Pastor Spencer here from Shushwap Community Church in Chase, uh, in front of the beautiful Chase Creek Falls. And just want to start our service with a call to worship from the book of Psalms. Psalm 100 says this, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is good. It is he who made us. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's let that psalm rest in our hearts and lead us into this time of joyous songs together. SEC, as we join together in worship, let's look at Psalm 42. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My th soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while well, they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How will I go with the throng and lead them in the procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise and multiple keeping the festival? Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me, therefore I remember you in the land of Jordan, of Hermon, and Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep, at the roar of your waterfalls, all the breakers in your waves have gone over me. By the day, by day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you for forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the opposition of the enemy? As with deadly wounds in my bones, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul, 
And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to gather, uh, even though we're apart and we're spread out and we're in our homes and we're online all over the place, Lord God, we are still gathered together as the church because we gather in you. We know where our God is. We know where our hope is. We know where our salvation comes from. So, Father, we thank you this morning. We ask that you would teach us, you would lead us and guide us. Your Holy Spirit would have freedom to convict us, as Pastor Ben preaches, that your Holy Spirit would have convicted to, uh, freedom to convict us in our hearts and our minds as we turn our souls over to you this morning again anew. Father, help us to worship you and honor you and glorify your Son. We pray in your name. Amen. Great is your faithfulness, O God of Jacob. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead me by still waters into mercy. Where nothing can keep us apart. morning, SDC. Uh, my name is Jordan. I'm the campus pastor in Salmon Arm, and I'm with Bob Evans, who is the campus pastor in Sycamuse. And we've been asked to do a interview uh, for this weekend service, looking at where we've seen Christ at work around us, through us, in us, uh, which gives us the opportunity to tell some stories to hopefully encourage the church that Christ is still at work. Um, so I'm going to start on where I've seen Christ working around me uh, over the last couple of months, and then Bob's going to speak into that too. When March hit, uh, I got to see firsthand the church, uh, the, the speed of response to both say, okay, where are the needs? Where can we help? Where can we be involved on uh, generosity with giving out food and finances and saying, is there needs that we can help serve in? Uh, I've seen uh, the support of, again, food banks and our partners and the and SEC saying, you know, point me in the right direction. Like, I, I want to be serving. I want to be present in this community. 
Uh, I've heard a lot of stories of people gathering safely together over the last couple of weeks, which all of that's encouraging to me because when I see that, I see people sharing that bond uh, of faith, even in the midst of COVID, even with distance. Um, and that's been encouraging. Yesterday, I got a call from a guy who needed help with a, a bit of a random task. It was very odd, but he had a bad neck injury. He couldn't do anything about the thing he needed help with. So he said, hey, you don't know me. I'm new to town. Do you have people that could help me today? And we phoned a couple of our members and they said, yeah, absolutely. We'll be there. They wouldn't help this guy just generously. Uh, and I got to sit back and be reminded that Christ is working around us in all these ways I get to get a glimpse of. And sometimes I don't get to see, but I'm reminded that our church gets to be involved in what Jesus is doing. And as we look around the whole church, we can see different stories, different, you know, reminders that Christ is still at work, which is incredible. So I've definitely seen Christ at work around us in a whole bunch of different small ways over the last couple of months. And what about you, Bob? <laughs> Where have you seen Christ working around you the last couple of months? Well, good morning, church. Uh, Jordan, you would have made a good newscaster. you got a great voice, <laughs> good, good presence. You kind of sound uh, like you and An Andrew Chang from CBC are like brothers from different mothers, dude. Like, Love it. He's, he's got the same, uh, same style. It's pretty cool. Um, I've seen Jesus working uh, in, in, in a few ways. One is um, I realized that if this crisis had happened 10 years ago, we would have been in a real bind because, A, the Internet in Sycamus 10 years ago wouldn't have allowed this kind of video. Um, it just wasn't powerful enough. And uh, on top of that, um, the technology just wasn't there. There was no Zoom. There was no even Facebook Messenger, which I've had several Bible studies um, on that and, and meetings as well. And nobody had an iPhone 10 years ago. It was a luxury item. And, and uh, so I can see the timing of it. I can see Jesus working in the timing of it and how he's using that. Although it's not as good as face-to-face, -face, for the first month it really helped to have that um, technology to visit our folks. And um, I see him at work because – in, in the people around us, the Lord is giving them creativity to keep the Great Commission going and to keep loving the people around them. Um, like you said, they're, they're giving money, they're giving food, they're dropping off food at the hub, which we take to the food bank. The food bank has been blessed by the amount of food that our church has given. Um, and uh, some folks have been going over there and helping them as well. Um, and uh, two ladies in our church did a, uh, the Lord worked around them by giving them the idea to do a uh, clothing um, giveaway because the thrift store is being shut down. Um, Gwyneth and Margot had the idea to, to get out some tables and collect high quality clothing and just tell people to show up and get the clothes they needed because the thrift store had been shut down. So I thought that was fantastic. But on, on top of that, I see Jesus working around us because I can see how through the creativity he's giving Christians, people have been saved. So one young couple contacted us and said that we've been watching online and uh, we are going to be in church when you reopen. Thank you for bringing us back to the Lord through doing online stuff. So I, I can see that as, as Jesus working around us. Even when in our weakness we can't meet with human weakness of, of this COVID thing and just trying to sort it all out. So that's pretty cool. That's so good. Man, it's like a week or a month goes by and somebody else gets saved and we get to rejoice in Christ's faithfulness in the church, which is amazing. Love that, yeah. man. Um, I think of Christ working through me. Uh, a friend of mine, Karina, does a lot of our social media, uh, and she's incredible. And she sent this verse uh, to me and then posted it social media. Second John 12, though I have much to write to you, I'd rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. Um, there was a guy in our church, Gary, this brilliant idea of just saying, let's do a donut run. Let's go see a bunch of people and families in SCC. Let's go visit door to door. Uh, you know, maintain distance, ding dong donut, and uh, and then get out of there. And it was incredible. I got to go touch base with, uh, you know, Stan and Kay, Richard, Patty, Celeste, 
uh, these families, uh, Johnson's and Ashton's and all these families and to see them again, it, it was so naturally joy filled. Like I, I, the pictures showed just a beaming face and that's the extrovert maybe being with people once again. But I think it was that reunited, um, this is the joy that Christ would have his people experience when they're together in community. And I got to do this quick visit, hear some stories, share some laughs, give some donuts and leave. And yet that joy carried like into this week. I was just, uh, to, to be the face of Christ in this moment of saying, you're seen, you're cared for, you're loved. Can I pray for you? Like to, to be able to whisper those truths and know that that's actually Christ at work through a member of his church into his church was humbling. Like that's so humbling and also just oh, fun, man. It was so fun. So when I think of Christ working through me, I think it's that moment of just being together uh, with his church once again and, and Christ being able to remind people of his promises, his presence, his, um, his care and love for people. And, and to a certain degree, we as pastors get to embody a level of that as we shepherd the church. So that's one mm. story that comes to mind. What about you when you think about Christ working through you? Uh, I'm thinking about the fact that he's still using me when um, me, like everybody else, has been having a really hard time with this. I, um, it was about a month into this that I was driving with my wife, Sandra, and we were driving down the highway and come back from Salmon Arm from some errands. And, and, uh, I was quiet and just Sandra says, I think you're kind of depressed. And I said, I am. And, uh, I realized that she was right. And what it was, was that I, uh, the life-giving parts of interacting with people regularly um, and the joy of being together with the church on the whole weren't happening. And, uh, and I was um, struggling with that. And that is when um, I realized a couple things. One is I've got to make sure that I'm getting my life from Jesus and not just the buzzes that happen through ministry of people and church and all that stuff. But, but also it, it pointed out to me that, that Jesus still uses jars of clay and, and the glory of God is contained in, in men and women that have cracks in them and he shines through the cracks. And, and uh, if, if you're, I was able to, thank Sandra for pointing it out to me and uh, get some people to pray for me as a person too. And, and uh, I saw Jesus working through them because they then ministered to me. And, and it's interesting um, how the Lord moves in people's hearts to do different things. And uh, even, even yesterday, two days ago, uh, I got a little card from two little families in the church because you, I don't know about you, Jordan, but you feel pretty useless when you're trying to do anything spiritual looking at the phone. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> and, totally. And, and then when, when you, uh, you can't get nonverbal feedback, <laughs> it's just like, okay, this is a lame talk. I don't know what I'm doing. And uh, if somebody brings the card by with a pack of lifesavers, says your lifesaver and what you're doing is impacting us. And that made my day. And, and it's just, okay, the Lord is still using lame means that I think it's lame sometimes I have to preach into a phone, but he's using uh, lame people through lame means to do good stuff. Cause you're still planting eternal seeds in people's hearts and the Lord's still working that seed of the word of God, whether it's heard over a phone or in person, the word of God doesn't come back to us empty and void. So I can see the Lord working through that, hmm. through that uh, weakness, that human weakness. Right. And uh, I'm, I'm in a better emotional state than it was a month ago, but I'll tell you, it was, it was, it's tough. I think it's tough on everybody. And, uh, I think we have to realize Jesus will work through us even when we're having a, an hard time like this. So totally. yeah. this is pretty crazy. I I'm frustratingly type a. So when I go into interviews like this, I, I pre slot some of my thoughts in, and this is going to mm -hmm. feel pre scripted, but Bob and I didn't share anything ahead of time. That when I think about Christ working in me, it's very similar to what you just shared, Bob. Mm. 
I, I've faced such low days and such hollow, um, depressed feelings and thoughts and my energy has been zapped and I've got this perpetual fatigue. I can't get, um, you know, those Friday moments carry me for a long time because on the whole, I've been removed from people that I love dearly in the church and the faces I am, I, I delight in seeing and being with. And when I think of Christ's work in me in that regard, there's this story that, oh, it's come to mind a lot over COVID when David in the Old Testament has every intention to build the temple and he's going to go forward and do it. And then he gets told, actually, you're not going to the guy. It's going to be your son for these reasons. I just read that. Yeah. Did you? Um, yeah. I've got the, oh, I'm going to read two verses because this is what I've sensed Christ doing in my own heart of drawing like David, when he was at his broken state, God drew him near like a son, just this little boy drew him close. And I feel like that's what Christ has been doing in my heart in this first Chronicles 17. David uses this just affectionate language to God says, and what more can David say to you for honoring your servant? For, you know, your servant for your servant's sake, O Lord. And according to your own heart, you've done all this greatness in making known all these great things. There's none like you, O Lord, there's no God beside you. And he just, his, his whole basis of his prayer is that, you know, me like you, my God, you know me. And at this broken heart aching, like before that, it just says he went and just sat before God. And I feel like COVID's given every experience to do just that. There's, there's very little to do um, it's on days, it feels like, or there's lots to do with very little results that we get to see immediately. And he just went and sat before God and said, what can I even say to you? You know, and Christ has been reminding me of his presence, his nearness, his, 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 um, his affection and love and care for me. when. I might be feeling a lack of it entirely. And so hmm. I've been, um, yeah, those are, those are hard days, but Christ has been at work and just drawing out of those hard days, me nearer to him, uh, which has been mm -hmm. a, a grace in a long roundabout way. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what about you? It, well, yeah, I, in my life and in the lives of a lot of people, I know is Jesus is working in us by, calling us to see he's still here. He's still at work. He's still sovereign. He's in charge. This is part of his plan as crazy as that sounds. And he knows what he's doing. And, uh, the little Kings of the earth, um, he's reminded me aren't in charge. He is the King over all those little Kings. And he's actually got a strategy in this whole thing. And, uh, he's working in, in my life by, uh, giving me more time with him than usual and, uh, introduced me to a new reading plan. And I'm really enjoying the breadth of scripture, not just the depth of it. And, uh, the scene, the large story. And I see how he's also in other people's lives, giving them a call and spending more time. They're spending more time with the Lord. And, and also, um, how powerful his music is and mm. and the worship music that uh, people are introducing my my daughter is that um, I think Bethany said she listened to forty two thousand minutes of Spotify worship music last year or something because it tells you what and this so my daughter's like, Dad, have you heard this song? I'm like, no, what is it? And she tells me and I go listen to it and the Lord uses that song to get into my my DNA and sometimes you wake up and it's in your brain and I know the Lord's using that worship music in me to encourage me and be the fuel so and i come home and i hear my wife listening to worship music my daughters and it's like it changes the atmosphere to have christ working in us through scripture through sermons through um through through music and then through people too because it's uh it's cool to see how he works in people to motivate them to do things and he totally gave them the idea yeah it, it wasn't their idea you know that what they they prayed and the lord up downloaded something into their brain or uploaded whatever the word is and 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 gave them an idea and it works marvelously and you know that it was him it had to be him so that's how i've seen him working in in people and in my life yeah Forty-two thousand minutes, man. Time well spent. That's excellent. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh yeah, she's doing her hair, doing her makeup. She's in the shower. She's got worship music blaring. It's it's pretty cool. Love it. 
You've got a far better backdrop than I, by the way, for interviews. Well done. Good job on the backdrop. Um, <laughs> it's, it's more fun than mine. There's more color. Oh, the white walls. Let me pray oh, okay. for us and then uh, we'll wrap up. Okay. Thanks, Jesus, for your church. Thanks for Bob. Thank you for uh, the campuses throughout SCC. Would you, Jesus, continue to work around us, through us, in us? Would we be mindful of what you're accomplishing for your glory and your honor? And be reminded and comforted by the fact that you use lame people to accomplish your purposes because you are great in our weakness. Your power is made, put on display. We love you. We thank you for all that you're doing. It's in your name, name we pray. Amen. 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 Cool, bro. Thanks. Yeah, man. Talk to you soon. Yeah, see ya. Good morning, SCC. This is one of our central services, which means that uh, via the digital medium, we are gathering from Chase, Sorrento, Salmon Arm, and Sycamus, and maybe even Enderby. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. I'm going to bow. We're going to pray, pray for uh, our time together, pray for our communities as well, and then we're going to open up God's word. Our Father, as we humbly bow before you this morning, we say, hallowed be your name. We know that in Christ you have granted us uh, a true spiritual Sabbath. And today we rest in the knowledge that we are at peace with you, that we're at peace with others, that we're at peace with ourselves. Oh, Lord, that you would bring a great healing into our hearts and to our minds by that truth. That that truth would penetrate deeply inside of us, that it would, it would cause us to be both humbled and yet delighted. Humbled in the fact of your grace, a grace and a mercy that, that is undeserved that you've given to us. And yet delighted, delighted in the fact that, that you show grace because you love us. Lord, that's what we want our communities to see. So we would pray that you would reveal yourself. That you'd reveal yourself to the hurting, to the lost, to the lonely throughout the shoe swap, throughout British Columbia, throughout Canada, and throughout the whole world, and that you would use the church to do it, that you would use our church to do it. Lord, we know that at this point in history, the church is functioning in a different way, but she does not cease to exist, and you have continued to bless her with everything that she needs to pursue the kingdom and to pursue the glory of God here on earth. Show us how you've provided that for us. Show us the, the, the daily provisions by your word and, and in relationship with you that we can find ourselves strengthened and emboldened to speak the good news of the gospel, the good news of forgiveness. Lord, that you would cause us to be aware of the temptations that as we're in the world, Lord, we would trust that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world and that we would engage not just with boldness but with discernment and that you would deliver us by your victory uh, over the flesh and over the world and over the devil and those influences in our lives as we open up your word this morning. Uh, might you show us spiritual reality and might we hear your voice. In your name and for your glory we pray. Amen. I'm going to read uh, Luke chapter 14 verse 7 down through 11 and it's on the screen. If you'd like to follow along or you can read along in your own Bible. Now he, that's Jesus, told a parable to those who were invited. When he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your friend the host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. May God honor the reading of his word. Back 80 years ago, Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was one of the greatest preachers of the 20th century, spoke to his church during World War II and tried to help them understand that the times that they were living in were a chance to reflect as a mirror and as a lens, that war provided that. 
war was a mirror for them, that it gave them a greater understanding of themselves, but war was also a lens. It gave them, it gave them a greater understanding of who God was. I've been thinking about that lots, especially during the pandemic, and, and that imagery kind of transcends wartime. Pandemic shows us things about ourselves. It shows us particularly our privilege, if you will. Our pandemic fatigue has shown us how ingrained our rights are to us as we have demanded even a return to normal life without deep consideration of why that fatigue is there in the first place. The pandemic has shown us our privilege, the The race riots in the states speak about privilege. As a church in the West, in the most beautiful place in Canada, maybe in the whole world, it would be good for us to consider our privileges in light of of what's going on in other parts of the world. At the beginning of the pandemic, I read this um, by an Indian doctor, a doctor in, in the nation of India. He says this, social distancing is a privilege. It means you live in a large house enough to practice it. Hand washing is a privilege too. It means you have access to running water. Hand sanitizers are a privilege. It means you have money to buy them. Lockdowns are a privilege. It means you can afford to be at home. Most of the ways to ward off corona are accessible only to the affluent. In essence, a disease that was spread by the rich as they flew around the globe will now kill millions of the poor. All of us who are practicing social distancing and have imposed a lockdown on ourselves must appreciate how privileged we are. Many, in, many Indians won't be able to do this. Another conversation around privileges and, and these terms, and I don't know about you, but when I first read that, I got a little bit defensive, as though this man didn't understand what pandemic was costing me. Yet... What the gospel allows me to do is to engage the truth that's both in the world and in my heart rather than react to it. See, we have this chance even right now to find comfort in our faith and not in our privileges. And this is the lens by which we will see God in the midst of this particular affliction. The passage we just read about will shed light on our own privilege, our position, and our posture, and what we do with it. And so, as we look at it, we do so humbly. I mean, it's right there in the passage. That's our, the appropriate posture for reading this. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Jesus has just finished healing a man, a man with a disease called dropsy. What we saw and what we see in that passage that we in Sam and Arm talked about last week was that, was that this disease and its affliction required Jesus' healing. At the same time, it, it may not have been necessary. He could have waited a day. He could have waited until the Sabbath was over. But he did it anyways because not only was it necessary that this man not suffer a day longer than he had to, but it was also appropriate that Sabbath gives peace. This has obviously brought up the defenses of the Pharisees and those people who are sitting in positions of honor at the table. So Jesus follows up with a parable. He tells a parable about a wedding. Jesus set a lot of his parables at weddings. Maybe that was because it, it was a common um, event for any, everyone. I mean, we've all been to weddings as well. Maybe he used parables as, as his predominant place for, uh, maybe he used weddings, I'm sorry, as his predominant place for parables because those are the places that bring out the best in people but also the very worst in people. At the very least, it was a relatable example. Everybody would have been to a wedding and in those small communities in those days, the whole town would be invited. I think Jesus liked to set his parables at weddings not only because it was common and easy to, easily understood metaphor, but because it had spiritual significance. You see, marriage is a big deal to God. It was part of the original design. We see marriage at the, at the pre-fall in Genesis chapter 2 when God brings Adam and Eve together. It's also how the New Testament teaches we're to understand the relationship between Christ and his church. That we, the church, are the bride of Christ and and he, the perfect husband, demonstrates sacrificial love to rescue and redeem his beloved. 
But there's one more reason I think Jesus found it significant to set his parables in weddings. The book of Revelation describes what it will be like when Jesus has returned and time as we know it will have ended. What will happen then? Revelation 19 tells us there will be a great wedding feast. Now, whether it's a literal feast or a metaphor of the joy and celebration that will occur on that day, we don't really know. But what's important is who's there. Revelation 19.9 says this, And the angel said to me, write this down, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. These are the true words of God. That's what the angel wants the Apostle John to write down. Why? Because he wants those words to spread out. The biblical significance of weddings and the understanding of a wedding feast is crucial because our first instinct is to read this passage that we've just read about as as Jesus sharing some common sense wisdom. That This is an illustration for a sermon entitled, How to Not Be Humiliated. But here's what we do know from the Gospels is that Jesus never preaches how-to sermons. He preaches kingdom sermons. He preaches sermons to describe the work that God is doing, that demonstrate what God is like, so that we would be transformed by joy and hope and peace and love, by grace and his power. And so when we look at this common situation and consider the characters, we do so trying to understand the spiritual significance for those of us who would identify as the bride of Christ and would hope for an invitation to the wedding feast described in Revelation 19. So here we've got this outrageous scene. We've got someone who arrives, this guest arrives early. He surveys the dinner arrangements and he chooses a prominent place in the room and and seats himself. If he was like us, he probably would have taken off his long cloak and put it over some seats to save it for some other noble people. But he's made a critical mistake. See, he's come so early that they haven't even finished preparing the room. He's come so early that they haven't put out the name places yet. See, he came so early that he thought it was a general seating wedding when actually it was an assigned seated wedding. Jesus could have easily said this, this man has shown up early. He saved his seats without realizing that the seat he took was grandma's seat. She's on her way, but it's taken her a while because she's coming on her walker and she does things in her own time, but she is coming. You see, Nana's coming to dinner and she's more important than you and you're sitting in her seat. And the father of the bride who you thought was your friend is going to come and have you removed and seated with weird second cousins and friends from camp. And he's going to have to do it in front of everyone. In describing this man, Jesus says he's having a critical error in his thinking. He has overvalued his place at the wedding. He has overestimated his privilege. He has thought of himself more important than he actually is. And in so doing, the joy of the wedding was replaced with embarrassment. His privilege was found in where he was sitting in the room, not that he was invited to the wedding in the first place. His miscalculation and subsequent embarrassment lies in this. He felt entitled to the place of honor, which means that he took for granted the invitation. He forgot that the celebration that was the glory of the couple required humility and the sacrifice of the glory of self. And at some point, his privilege became his right and led to his humiliation. When it comes to a celebration like a wedding, it's the invitation that matters. I mean, that's the thing, right? All guests are invited to what? They're invited to share in the joy of the couple and their families. When you go to a wedding, you're invited to receive joy. And in receiving joy, you're sharing joy. Because the whole purpose of wedding is delight. That's why, and I'm very passionate about this, the best weddings are the weddings where the most important people are the congregation of the guests. The best weddings are that when the bride and the groom and their families are planning it, are having in mind as top priority 
the happiness of their guests. I think that's one of the reasons people brisk at receiving wedding invitations these days because of what it requires of them, a costly gift and travel. The simple thing of having to kill four hours between the ceremony and the reception while pictures are being taken and then trying to get through an evening of speeches by college roommates and fake laughing at all the inside jokes. But the best weddings are the ones planned with the guests in mind. And this is God's approach to weddings. This is God's approach to joy. This is God's approach to all activity. All of his activity is about our joy, even the cross. We look at the cross and what we see is the pain and the suffering and the anguish of Christ. But Hebrews tells us that it was for joy that Christ endured the cross, that it was the joy that was set before him, that he willingly laid down his life, showing us that the purpose of all of God's activity is our joy. He sacrificed himself so that you and I could have delight. And when we have delight, God gets glory. When you're happy at a wedding, the couple gets glory. And your joy is in this, not where you are in the room, but rather in the invitation. Christian, here is what your invitation to the wedding feast means. It means this, that you're known and loved by God. So much so that he's brought you to this great celebration. It means that you're important in giving God glory. In fact, you're essential in giving God's glory. The wedding, the invitation to the wedding means that you will receive joy. This man, his position was based on proximity and not posture. That's why Jesus says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. When you think about that, when you think about all of God's activity being about your joy for his glory, what it does is it humbles. Humility literally means this. It means knowing your place. It's focusing on someone else. Biblical humility, gospel humility, is about focused on, being focused on one person, and that's Jesus. We focus on Jesus as our Lord. See, he's your Lord. He's good to you. He saves you. And salvation is a gift. And because of that, we all know our place. We don't have to jockey for position. We don't have to assert ourselves into a position around the table that does not belong to us because we know this, our place is not on the throne, but on our face before the throne. So Jesus here is giving a warning about the kingdom. He's saying this man didn't feel joy at the invitation nor at the celebration. All he felt was humiliation. Everyone around him was happy and he was miserable. And every time he would remember that wedding, he would cringe. What is Jesus telling us? In the pursuit of his own joy, by his own arrogance, through his own privilege, he found himself humiliated. Instead of assuming a posture of humility, he claimed a position of privilege. Pride was his problem. This is what God in Christ does. He humbles the proud, and he exalts the humble. And what Jesus is describing here is an essential kingdom principle and work of God. When in Luke 11, 14, 11, he says that the proud will be humbled and the humbled will be exalted, we're seeing the essence of God, God's work. New Testament callers call this, call this a theological passive. What that means is that this is just showing us God's active work and our passive approach to it. A theological passive is all about the personal and active work of God. So when we read this, that God opposes the proud, we're seeing that it is active and not passive. It's not that you won't be invited, it's that you'll be removed. God opposes the proud, and we see that throughout all of Scripture particularly in Genesis chapter 14. It's a story that I've gone back to a lot. The book of Genesis tells us what happened in ancient history, but it's also, it also gives light on what happens in current history. In Genesis 14, we read the story of the Tower of Babel. It's this crazy story that occurs after the flood. 
And it's a powerful story because it shows us that the pride of corporate humanity brings about confusion and chaos forever. It really is a story about hubris. The people in rebellion against God, against God's commandment to go and spread out over the earth and fill it said, now we're just going to stay together and we're going to build a tower up. So rather than going out, they built a tower up. They used their technology, they used their ingenuity to carve out a safe and comfortable life. Because to spread out and fill the earth and subdue it would mean that they would have opposition against them. Whether that be, whether that be nature, whether that be animals, whether that be other nations, they said, nah, we're safer here. Let's build a tower up to God. See, they, they used their technology to show that they didn't need God. And the people in their pride not only declared independence from God, but actively sought to stick it to him by working hard and showing, hey God, we're equal. We're going to get to you. So what does God do? He actively opposes them. He comes down. He humbles himself. And he brings confusion. That's where we get language. It's where we get race. It's where we get the separation of culture. God brings confusion by, by giving everyone there a different language and they scatter. And God accomplishes his purpose. God opposes the proud and accomplishes his purpose. We've been living in the most technologically advanced time in all of history. And for a long time, it made us feel comfortable and safe. Because of our technology, though, we have a false sense of security, thinking we don't actually need God. Yet because of a disease that our technology can't defeat, we've been left confused and scattered. In a way, there's been a great humiliation of the whole world. As our privileges have been exposed, God has also exposed our false senses of security. When I read this passage and I think about this man and, and I think about me being that man, I get a little bit defensive. Whenever anybody kind of calls us out, that's what happens. Jesus had seen this scene take place in, at that very meal. Not that it was a wedding, but that everybody was jockeying for a position near the host. I would like to think that that wouldn't be me, but I can't stand in a line with any sort of patience. I always like to think that the line at the bank or at the grocery store is for somebody else. That defensiveness shows my resistance, and I think in the hearts of all of us, there's some questions that we would say and ask around this man. Like, wasn't he just being assertive? Assertiveness is a good thing. It's good when we're asking for what we need. Assertiveness is good when we're looking for ways to stand up or step up for the vulnerable. But it's abused and distorted when we use our assertiveness to demand our place at the table. When our assertiveness brings us into conflict with others, that's when we're abusing it. Was this man just being assertive? No, he was being proud. Another question. Didn't this man just have a healthy self-esteem? Right? Didn't he just carry himself with dignity? Didn't he just carry himself with self-respect? Jesus is saying in this passage that pride is what's wrong with the world. What the world says is wrong with the world is low self-esteem. Thinking our problem is low self-esteem, is actually the problem, but that's how we're conditioned. We're conditioned to look at ourselves. We're conditioned to look at ourselves for success. And if you're not succeeding in the world, then you're not living up to your potential. You're not thinking of yourself highly enough. The world will say this, you know why you're depressed? Low self-esteem. The world will say, you know why you're not successful? Low self-esteem. That's the mantra of culture, and it's evil. Our problem, our problem is not a low self-esteem. Our problem is pride. It's self-involvement. 
It's more than just being self-aware, it's being self-obsessed. Romans 12, 5 says this, do not think more highly of yourself than you ought. Think of yourself sober-mindedly. Think of yourself truthfully. That statement in Romans is balanced. It's not to think more lowly of yourself or more highly of yourself. It's to think of yourself truthfully. Here are the three truths that we should think about ourselves that balance out our high, too high of esteem or too low of esteem. Number one, you're created in the image of God. That's where your value lies. All the good in you, God placed in you by his design, by his sovereignty, and by his love. He created you in his image. That's where your inherent value lies. Not in how you can convince yourself that you're special, but that God has already deemed that before the foundation of the world. The second truth is that you are completely sinful. Our thinking about ourselves is distorted and our motivations are selfish. Therefore, we shouldn't trust ourselves or the justifications that we have for our actions. So, we are creating the image of God. That's where our value lies. At the same time, we are completely sinful and shouldn't trust how we think or how we feel. The third truth brings these two things together. God loves you. It's reconciled in this. The hope is in this, that the beauty of your imago Dei, that you're creating the image of God, has been glorified and magnified by Christ's work on the cross to remove the sin, the things you don't like about yourselves. And God does it. God saves. We know that because Jesus sacrificed himself to show us that love. And that's where your value is demonstrated. You don't have to claim it. You don't have to defend it. You just got to believe it. Did this man just have a healthy self-esteem? That's not the problem. Third question we might ask is, wasn't this man really just claiming his rights? Jesus talking to these distinguished people, having seen them jockey for position before he had healed a man, healed a man who wasn't treated with any kind of honor, Jesus observes that, that there's a class structure at place, even a class warfare, if you will. They would claim to be an inclusive culture. They would say anyone can come to a meal. Anyone can come to a wedding. And they might have been culturally inclusive, but they were functionally exclusive. As the man with dropsy shows us. He was invited, but he was not welcome until Jesus healed him. For them, it was their cultural right to function in this way, to have a nobleman's seat. They had studied for this. They had, had worked hard to attain this kind of a lifestyle, to have the places of honors. But it wasn't their inherent right See, it was this man's false sense of self that his value was his, in his position, not the relationship that led to his humiliation. Was he just claiming his rights? Maybe. Were those rights spiritually valuable? No. See, we as Christians, we exist as citizens of a different kingdom. With that in mind, we've advocated some of our rights. As Canadians, we have rights. But as Christians, we took those rights and we put those in an open hand. And we've got to be very careful about the rights we claim and when to claim them. So let me bring this home and apply it to a situation that we as a church have been thinking about, praying about, and wrestling with. We've lived through an unprecedented time in modern history, not since World War II. Has the world been confronted by a common enemy that has required some drastic adjustments to our, adjustments to our lifestyle? And it's been hard, hasn't it? It's taxed our physical, our emotional, and our spiritual resources. For me, and I know for many of you, we are feeling in our bodies and in our souls the effects of not being able to gather for church. The good news is that things are progressing. BC has done a phenomenal job of limiting the spread of the coronavirus, and we as a church take seriously our adherence to that, and I think we should say we made some of the right choices. That said, the government's still limiting the size of our groups to 50 or less. 
They're doing it because they're concerned about the spread. And we know that the places where it spreads quickly are cruise ships, nursing homes, movie theaters, and church buildings. To date, theaters haven't opened and schools barely have. And so we are left with a choice. Do we gather in a modified way with masks and social distancing? Do we take everybody's name and phone number at the door? In order to do that, we would have to exclude people like the elderly and like the sick. We, we would have a hard time inviting the lost if we have to limit the number of seats, wouldn't we? And that just goes against our values. Add to that, if someone at one of those gatherings is diagnosed, the best case scenario is that we would have to quarantine all 50 people, including the pastors, the staff, the worship team, and the volunteers for two weeks. That's the best case scenario if someone is diagnosed. The worst case scenario is that someone gets very sick. And yet, we know this, that relationships are so important to our mental and spiritual help. We know this, that, that this time, people in our communities are open to the gospel and that we've got to still be the church. So here's what we're going to ask you to do, Shoe Swap Community Church, for the next few weeks and months. Instead of going to church, we're going to ask you to find the church in order that we can continue to be the church. What do I mean by that? I mean this. Throughout the summer, get together with another family too. Get together with your life group, with your if table, with your huddle. Get together with those people that you've welcomed into your life already before all of this stuff came down. Bring your families into those groups as well. And you can do this in any number of different ways during the week. You can meet on Sunday and take in the digital content together if you wanted to. Or you could just gather for an evening during the week to hang out, talk about God, pray for one another, eat a meal together, let the kids run around and play. This means that we need people to open up their homes or their patios, and if you're able to do that and would want to do that, please let your campus pastor know. Don't worry, we're not going to make you lead a Bible study. Don't disqualify yourself because you're like, ah, I can't facilitate a group. All we need is places and spaces. Providing hospitality is enough. If you're out there and you don't know how to find the church, we'll help you. If you're feeling disconnected and drifting, contact one of your campus pastors or the church office and we'll get you started. I'm going to ask you to be patient with us. Summer's a difficult time to kind of start anything normally, right? But we do have the pieces in place. We have the resources and they are available. We're just short of homes. We're short of people just getting together. Should this continue into the fall, we will get more and more organized and we're currently working on what that might look like. As Canadians, we have a right to gather and express our faith corporately. As Christians, right now, we're putting that in an open hand. We know that because of Christ, we've been graciously given a seat at the table. We also know that part of being a Christian is being willing to give up our seat. We know that it's our job as the invited to invite others. And this has been happening. You've heard some of the stories and you're going to continue to hear the stories of how our church has made an impact in lives. A recent Angus Reid poll said that one in five Canadians has been ministered to by a faith community during the pandemic. One in five we want to make sure that we keep the mission at the forefront of our thinking. It's going to take humility. But what's the promise? Grace. God opposes the proud, but God gives grace to the humble. See, through Christ, there's an invitation to a wedding feast, and it's going to be amazing, and it's never going to end. It will not be threatened by season. It will not be threatened by the weather. It will not be threatened by a pandemic. And it will be a feast like no other. And there will be a joy unlike anything this world has ever experienced. How do you know if you're invited? The cross. The cross is the invitation. Seems a little crazy that this rugged piece of unstanded wood hewn with an axe and not milled would be the invitation instead of 
instead of an embossed, bright white card with your name written in calligraphy. But see, it's the cross where our pride is exposed, but our humiliation is answered. The cross is the place for the unworthy. It's a place for the humble. Second Corinthians, Paul says this, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. What's your dignity? What's your place of honor? Being invited to the wedding. It cost Christ his life, but it will provide for you your joy. It will make you feel humble. Coming to the cross always should bring us to our knees. It may even humiliate us, and it should. But here's what happens. Jesus, who is the better host, comes to those who are on their knees. He comes to those who are at the end of the table. He comes to those who don't think they belong, belong there and think and feel a little bit embarrassed that they're there at all. He comes to the ones who are late, waiting in line with patience. He comes to the weary. He comes to the worn. He comes to the dirty, to those who don't have the proper clothes to wear. And what does he do? He gives them new clothes and he walks them into the feast. That's the joy. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, that you would bless us with the reality of your presence that we would see you high and lifted up and yet we would see your meekness and your mercy come close to each one of us. That in our humility, there would not be humiliation, but rather in your exaltation, we would receive joy. As we continue to worship throughout our communities, Lord, might our worship not be in the song that we listen to or that we sing along with. Might our worship be in the joy that we carry ourselves into our communities, into our relationships with our neighbors, or the people we work with, our families, and our friends. Might they see joy, and might they know your grace. In your name and for your glory we pray. Amen. What love could remember no wrongs we had done. Omniscient all knowing he counts not their son. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. could wait as we constantly roam. A Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What riches of kindness He lavished on us. His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood neath a death we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Oh, your grace. So free, why 
washes over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new without hope with no place to be your love made a way to let mercy come when death was arrested and my life began ash was redeemed only beauty remains to dance when death was arrested and my life began oh your grace so free washes over me you have made me new now life begins with you your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now life begins with you release from my chains I'm a prisoner no more my chain was a ransom He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. That's when when death, death was arrested and my life began, our Savior displayed on that criminal's cross. Darkness rejoices from heaven. arose with the freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now life begins with your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now life begins with you oh your grace so free washes over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now life begins with you I hope there's been something from this message this morning that's challenged your heart. Uh, I want to leave us with this benediction from the book of Ephesians. It says this, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think, according to the power of work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. If you would like prayer for anything, please reach out to your campus pastor. We'd love to be praying for you. If you need support for anything, please reach out to the church. We'd love to be helping you through this time. 
Um, but every church, go in grace and peace. Go knowing that we love you. Go knowing that we're praying for you. And we're looking forward to seeing you again next Sunday. Have a great week, everyone. We'll talk to you later. Bye.